Hello, I'm Ann McLean for Concerts from the Library of Congress. I'm delighted today to be talking with harpsichordist Mahan Espahani. Thanks for joining us. It's lovely to see you. It's nice to, to see you again. Yeah, and to be able to share your performance with a much larger audience than we could fit into the Coolidge Auditorium. That's right. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to be talking with you about two subjects I know are lifelong passions for you, the music of J.S. Bach and contemporary music for the harpsichord. So we can just jump in and uh, talk about, but Bach has really been something, um, a through line in your life since your childhood, I believe. That's right, yes. And uh, well, you know, Bach was always the, uh, if you like, the the intermediary for me discovering other music in a way i came to the music of you know mozart um a lot of contemporary music schoenberg things like that in a, in a funny way through bach um either with that composer's relationship with bach's music or you know in the case of schoenberg um their extraordinary insight with bach's music uh especially in writing about it so you know he's he's this um He's the kind of uh, Virgil, if you like, in my kind of journey. And um, so that's very, that's very special to me. And you said that you, when you encountered the harpsichord as a, as a young boy, that um, this started you on a path where you wanted to not so much necessarily be a harpsichordist, but spend your life with the harpsichord. And that's what I see in your career. It's, it's lovely to have followed this, you know. You know, I, I wanted to say that um, we are very pleased to be able to revisit with you a little bit of the conversations we've had in the past. And um, we are pleased that you were once able to play our playel instrument that was owned by Wanda Lodowska. And so since maybe a decade or so, we've been able to, to talk with you and follow your interests, particularly in Bach. So maybe let's start with this. How did you frame this program, which has the six little preludes? Um, and then how did you build it? It's a beautiful program. Well, of course, originally uh, when we had assumed shall we say, less fraught times and the assumption that I, that I would be in Washington. Of course, the hope was that I would come and play Landowska's play L for, you know, at least part of the concert. This is a very different animal from, from a period uh, harpsichord. Much has been, you know, discussed in that respect. And uh, the Six Little Preludes are actually uh, amongst the works of Bach, which Landowska recorded. Funny enough, in her career, of course, Bach is the composer with which she was the most... Uh, associated but actually she didn't record all that much of his music there are big there are big gaps in that discography i mean she only recorded well she recorded the goldberg variations twice she did the italian concerto she didn't do the french overture you know she didn't yeah. do um i think she only did the first and the second partitas for example things like that so there's big gaps there and uh but the six little preludes was one of the first recordings of hers that I'd heard, of course, on, on a CD transfer. And um, so I thought, well, that would, that would be quite, quite fun to, to play on the play L or maybe, you know, with the other Bach works on the program, I'd play one of them on the play L, the other one on the, on the, on the, on the Baroque copy. Been, yeah. um, and of course, they're, they're pedagog pedagogical works, we, we think, we don't really know. But um, they're actually really good program openers because it gives you a second just to sort of it's the sort of musical equivalent of that. You sort of get your fingers um, yeah. ready and he gives you, you know, the basic intervals that you're going to be working with. And so uh, it's a nice way of sort of easing into uh, easing, easing into the evening. You know, I, uh, I was looking at something about these pieces and I read that um, the, they were described as pieces for the beginner and the novice in a will or, of C.P. Evoch in hmm. 1790. And I hadn't seen that line before, uh, the term unfanger. Uh, just so that it's interesting. I knew they were sort of teaching pieces, but I never knew who he wrote them for. But one thing I wanted to say was that um, so many of us who are amateur pianists and amateur keyboard players are struck so much by the virtuosity of the writing and the complexity and the structures and so on. And we don't know so much about this, the legato. And um, I saw this comment about uh, Bach was writing in his inventions preface about how to arrive at the singing line. 
It's so interesting. And you bring these out, this out so much in these performances of these little pieces. It's so charming. Um, well, of course, you know, uh, what, he, what Bach means uh, when he writes that, and I think in the original German, he actually does say cantabile. So I think he, he actually does use the Italian term cantabile. What that means is, of course, a big discussion. Um, because, of course, firstly, 18th century writers are frequently talking about making music speak, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there are speech patterns in music, which, which inevitably, you know, have consonants and which have, uh, you know, accents, um, you know, things like, I don't know, glottal stops, you might have accents on certain parts of the, of the sentence, things of that nature. So, you know, when we talk about singing, we should be careful that uh, we don't think of the late 19th century, early 20th century no notion of cantabile as the unbroken line. Rather, uh, that singing is, a, is, you know, there's an impression of singing which, which has to do with the, with the distribution of consonants and of vowels in music and in words. And I think that frequently is, uh, is forgotten. I was listening the other day to um, Harnoncourt's recordings of the Beethoven symphonies. And of course, you know, if you look at uh, some of the great old recordings like Mengelberg, you know, for Fengler, Charles Munch, people like that. Um, they're oboists. There's that famous line uh, in the first movement of the first of the fifth symphony of Beethoven. There's that famous oboe solo. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, there are a number of oboists in the early 20th century who were praised for being able to master this unbroken line. But of course, the Hardencourt kind of turns that on his head and says, well, that's not that's not the only way to play cantabile. I mean, there can be breaths, there can be articulations. Uh, that's a conversation I frequently have with wind players about what do they mean about cantabile. So, you know, you might also say in the inventions and in the six, in the six little preludes, and of course there are other little preludes, that um, Bach is teaching us how to use phrasing to give the illusion that the instrument has lungs. And I think, and I think that's a kind of lifelong project for a harpsichordist. Exactly. That's a great way to answer that. Um, the, I'm so pleased that you are performing the French Overture, such a magnificent piece. And I was interested, I wanted you to talk about your comment that this is his magnum opus, that it shows what you're, you say puts the harpsichord through its paces. How does he illuminate this? Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, the, the French Overture, originally he calls it the, is the Overture de la Française Chaad, which is Overture in the French, um, you know, after the French manner. Uh, and... Uh, you know, this is very much French in a, in a Saxon German accent, of course, but Bach is taking um, what you might say are um, genres, styles that are in the ready vocabulary, central vocabulary, right? Things like uh, overtures, courants, you know, names of certain dances, gavots. He does this in the first part of Clever Ubu, which is the, which is the partitas as well. And um, he takes these known forms as a space for, uh, you know, if you like, as a space for reflection on the possibilities of these forms and the way that he can um, break out of the forms to say new things. So in the case of, uh, and he does this in the partitas as well, uh, in the case of this overture, for example, the introductions to these you know, high Baroque uh, French overtures, generally there was a sort of slow uh, introduction and then, you'd have a, and then you'd have a fugue. And for example, in the fugue, he imitates concerto style. There's a clear delineation between um, Tutti and the soloist. In the opening section, there's uh, the use of um, sort of subsidiary melodic material in a way which becomes motivic. You know, he makes a, a, mm -hmm. a motive out of unimportant material, which comes back later. Um, it might even come in the fugue. Um, he does that also in the sixth partita. And so, um, you know, what he's fundamentally doing by 1735, which is when he publishes um, the French Overture, is that he's taking Baroque forms but the message is very much a classical message, which is, uh, you know, which is based much more on a, um, you know, cyclical notions of motive. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a, you know, his style, it's not the Beethovenian style to simply break the mold. Bach's way of introducing revolutionary ideas is to do it through, um, to do it through known genres uh, and to sort of and to sort of um, turn them upside their heads. I mean, you you might say um, Jane Austen does this. Uh, if you look at a work like Lady Susan, for example, which is an uh, epistolary novel, right? It's a novel in 
um, in the form of letters. Um, that's, a, that's an old genre of novel that goes back to the early 18th century. But what she does in it, the way that she comments on, uh, you know, for example, how people are the victim of their social surroundings and how it leads them to make decisions, which, you know, might be out of, um, you know, keeping with their personal mores and such, uh, is actually quite revolutionary. I mean, had she, you know, had she broken the genre of the novel and done it as a, I don't know, a piece of performance art in the manner of, you know, Abramovich or something like that, in a sense, it might've been less effective because, mm -hmm. you know, she, she disarms, um, the reader and Bach in this sense disarms the listener by giving you something seemingly familiar, but mm -hmm. actually totally sort of setting it on fire and destroying it. And, and I think, and I think what's really interesting, Anne, is that um, this is the last great Baroque overture that's written. It's in, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, the sixth partita has the last great Baroque toccata written. It's almost like when he, when he says it, he, he both distills the history of the form and he so disturbs the goalposts that after that, wh who, what could you say? Yeah, exactly. You know, in terms of the sound itself, and I know that you have talked a lot about your teacher and her concept of pure sound. I wanted you to comment on that. But just that opening chord in your performance, it's so tragic. So for people who are not familiar with the harpsichord, the pluck string, you know, how it works and so on, but just um, from, from a general point of view, how do you create that sound? How do you oh, make it tragic? I don't remember what I did. Um, well, of course, it's a matter of timing, isn't it? Everything is a matter of timing. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, of course, it opens with a, with a four note chord in B mm -hmm. minor. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the first melody, the first bit of melodic, you know, material, let's call it, comes in. And I think that silence, just that kind of drama of that chord, mm -hmm. uh, you know, offers a lot of space for, um, you know, for time. For example, it has to do with how you roll the chord. One mm -hmm. might add an octave, for example. We know that in Bach's time, there are instruments with an extra register at the 16 foot, which produces an extra octave, which the playel, incidentally, has and I've had an instrument that's been built like that, and uh, you know that that space before he speaks, um, that's something that Bach learns from Handel, by the way. And I, I I used to I used to really dine out on not liking Handel's music. I actually adore <laughs> Handel. I think Handel is a god uh, yeah. of music, and certainly Bach thought so. And, and Handel has these wonderful things. Uh, for example, in the in the Opus Six and the Concerti Grossi, Opus Three, Opus Six. Uh, where simply waiting for material mm -hmm. has its own meaning. And I think mm -hmm. ba Bach learns from Handel this art of uh, building fairly solid edifices, which with, with, you know, not overly complex material. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you, if you look in the French overture, um, for most of it, you know, the, the keys are what, one, four, five, you know, fairly, fairly familiar keys. He doesn't go into any sort of double sharps, nothing like that. Uh, and, you know, he, he, it's not an orchestral transcription, but he gives the impression of this monumental quality um, that the harpsichord can have. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, since you mentioned my teacher, I mean, Ruzhishkova, uh, you know, that was kind of her gift as a player, was that she was, she was able to, create great architectural um, structures mm -hmm. in her playing. And um, so that's, I hope I learned a little bit of that from her, uh, but you know, it's too, it's too early to tell. You, you've talked about her saying that each note has a purpose or there's a purpose in every note and a level of maturity that comes through in this kind of thinking. In terms of sound and colors, it's really fascinating to hear this piece in that church setting, the, Church of Saints Simon and Jude. And I wanted to ask you quickly about the harpsichord itself. Is this a special instrument for you? This is my home instrument. I have, I have two instruments. Uh, one is an instrument that I had built two years ago with um, a carbon fiber soundboard because I was always tired of the instability of the instrument. Mm. And I thought, well, let's, let's mess around. Um, here with it, and I got I got an amazing builder to do it, and uh, and then it's it's very long. It uses uh, almost you know not quite, but almost sort of Pythagorean scaling and things like that. And um, he's a, he's a really magnificent uh, builder, and that lives in London. 
uh, because I use it for a lot of recording. And also it gets moved from London when I want to do big concertos and stuff like that. I mean, it, it is, this instrument is so loud um, <laughs> that you don't even need to amplify it for concertos, yeah. which, is quite, which is quite a feat. And yeah. then um, the instrument that I have at home uh, is a you know, fairly, it's a very good instrument, but it's a fairly bog standard copy of an early 18th century German instrument um, with not as many registers, not as many, uh, you know, bells and whistles, if you like. But it's kind of my instrument that gets abuse because I play everything from bird to sort of Zanakis on this instrument. And of course, as you as you hear in the program, um, the modern music also sounds you know pretty good on it. Yeah, and I was thinking, um, uh, well, I want to get to that in a moment. Uh, before we leave this and talk about the modern music, I wanted to ask you a question about the inner voices in the Landowska papers that you discovered. I noticed you had written about this. It's very interesting. What are those inner voices? Are they middle? Oh, yeah. Tell us about <laughs> that. Right here. Yeah. Well, actually, so uh, as you know, since I was uh, uh, just a, uh, you know, spring chicken, I was coming around to the Library of Congress and you guys let me rummage through all the Landowska stuff. And there'll be a, there'll be a book that'll come out of that at some point. But anyway, um, so. I looked through her, um, what's very precious about that collection is that you have all of her annotated scores of box music, which is, which is great. And she's written in, you know, you can see she's written in fingerings and phrasings. And um, in one of the pieces, which is the first bourree, she actually, as you can see, she writes in uh, an, uh, an alto voice to a two voice structure. And uh, I just thought it'd be kind of fun to play that. As it happens, she was preparing the French Overture for recording when she died in 1959. And so she never recorded it, but this is her, it's clear from this score that she was just getting to, ready to record it. And her most celebrated student, uh, which is, who is Raphael Puyana, recorded mm -hmm. it in the 1960s for, uh, I think for Mercury, um, uh, records in New York and he pretty much uses you know all of her he was a very uh, loyal student shall we say uh, and he did basically whatever she told him to do um, whereas of course Kirkpatrick was one of her students and he totally uh, rebelled against her and did nothing that she did um, some people said that Kirkpatrick even uh, uh, they said that he tried so hard to avoid being Landowska that he would fall back the other way. And um, so she, you know, either way you cut it, she was a very formidable uh, personality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Kirkpatrick is the only one of her students who doesn't sound like her. You know, he sounds nothing, he sounds like nothing, nothing like her and they, and they disliked each other in any case. Well, before we, uh, believe this magnificent overture. Um, tell us a little about the echo. It's so rare in Bach, the, at the end of the concerto. At, at the end of the, of the suite. At the end of the yeah. overture. Right. Um, God, that is some piece. Uh, well, you know, Bach is clearly evoking, uh, you know, ballet music. There's no question here, right? And the, and the French have these pièces de caractère, which, mm -hmm. uh, which, evoke and portray, uh, you know, quite literally the characters of the dance. And yeah. um, I like to think of, you have this gig, which m many people play quite quickly. I play it a little slower. And um, it's quite a, it's quite a, a pastoral, um, maybe pastoral is not the right word. It's quite a rustic gig. And then afterwards, the, um, the echo, you, I've always thought of it as being the sort of virtuoso dancers just enter the stage and sort of sweep up everything. And of course, literally the name implies echo because Bach very skillfully, and he indicates this in the score, he very skillfully indicates when you go to the upper manual, which he says is the piano as opposed to the forte register. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that um, it's meant to be done, I think, in this seamless way that would suggest an echo, except the funny thing about the echo is that the parts that are played in the upper manual are never exact echoes, hmm. right? They're never exact imitations. And so the, the question is, uh, you know, is it meant to imitate, uh, you know, this, when you have an echo in a reverberant space, you just hear a lot of sort of color rather than anything. Is he making a joke about it? Mm -hmm. It's not really clear, but... Um, You're so uh, charming. 
yeah, it is super charming. And it's very, um, compared to the rest of the, the suite, it, it, um, with the exception of the first movement, the rest of the suite it has a very 17th century quality. But this first and last movements very much anchor it uh, in the space of, of high 18th century music. Um, and it's certainly the sort of thing uh, that Bach would have heard if he went to Dresden, for example, to, to watch ballet, which we know he did. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's him, uh, you know, responding, if you like, to the world around him. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, um, let's talk about your your new music world and uh, your your passion for this as well. Your your work in new music uh, really spans so many things, and you've talked about the fifty plus modern concerti that exist now for the harpsichord, which I didn't quite realize. And you've commissioned a lot of work. Um, tell us about what you're doing now and how this is informed by your study of the past. So, actually, you know, if I had been in DC, um, what I really wanted to do was one of the many works that I do with um, an electric, uh, excuse me, electronic. Um, set up, right? So a lot of these pieces, I, I don't want to call them sound installations, but for example, there's um, Joseph Tall, um, who wrote one of the first works for harpsichord and electronics in the 1960s. There's um, Sariajo's um, Jardin Secret, which I, which I recorded. There's um, Luc Ferrari's um, uh, music, uh, music Socialiste, which I also recorded. Um, and and an, an, another, a number of other works which work with um, both pre-recorded and live electronics and things of that nature. And I like doing that just because I think the electronics and the harpsichord are a pretty happy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pretty happy marriage actually of, of, of media for, for various reasons. Um, mm -hmm. But actually in modern music right now, well, uh, because of Corona, they didn't get premiered yet. Um, I had commissioned in the past year, three concertos from there's Miroslav Srinka, who's the, a Czech composer, Paul Ruders, the celebrated Danish composer, wrote mm -hmm. me a concerto, and uh, Ben Sorensen wrote me a concerto, which I was supposed to be, uh, I was supposed to be in Norway two weeks ago doing it, but it didn't happen, yeah. so it's its nice that at least it's there. Uh, and, you know, there's a few commissions coming up. There's people like, um, uh, you know, Gavin Breyers, um, Jin Wook Jones is that. really interesting. Yeah, he's I, that's going to be super interesting. Yeah, um, he's and, interesting. Uh, uh, you know, Jin Wook Jung is a young uh, Korean composer. Um, I'm supposed to talk to Hannah Kendall tomorrow about a new piece. So, you know, it's because, of course, composers are interesting people and, you know, their brains are big. I mean, let's be honest, composers have the biggest <laughs> brains amongst us. So, so hey, you know, if they, if they have a perspective on the instrument that I might not have, you know, win-win, right? I mean, that's good yeah. for, for me. But actually for, for the um, stream performance that I've done for you, uh, these are two fairly classic works. I mean, Andreessen's um, Overture to Orpheus is already 39 years old. You know, it's not, it's not a new, new piece. Um, and then the two pieces by Martineau are, are um, posthumous works, um, which were published after he died, but pro they may have been written in the 1930s. It's not really clear. But um, those, are, those are tremendous works because by the end of the second one, it's clear that he's just breaking the instrument you know he's almost making a a joke out of it mm -hmm. um which i so love symphonic whereas, so symphonic, symphonic. Ab absolutely whereas in the andreessen you feel like he's pulling the expression out of the instrument and he's you know you get a sense that he's sort of you know he sort of taps the instrument and he listens to what it says and i, and yeah. I find that uh that for lack of a better term that minimalist approach of andreessen creates a remarkable tableau of color, whereas uh, whereas Marchinu is maybe giving a famous uh, hand, internationally recognized hand expression to the harpsichordist uh, <laughs> with with what he writes, you know. But I I love both I love both of these pieces, and and you know, and uh, you know, it's 2021 now. When we say contemporary music for the harpsichord, look, the first modern work written for the harpsichord, the major one is. Faya's Concerto, 1926. So it's mm -hmm. almost—it's almost a almost hundred years that we have—we have new music for this instrument. Yeah, and your career really spans the spectrum of the harpsichord's existence, from the very earliest pieces written for it, and obviously the very newest ones. And you've said that interesting music is coming out of Iran, which I for the harpsichord. Super which, interesting music. Yeah. It, so, um, and I had wanted to ask you about something you said that the 
the harpsichord's existence was questionable in those early days as it is questionable now. And I wondered what you meant by that. Mm. Well, actually, you know from the Library of Congress's own archives that when Landowska played to, came to play at the Library of Congress in her first American tour in the 1920s, um, incidentally, on that tour, she also played the Poulain Concerto um, in Chicago Symphony. When I was at Chicago Symphony playing the Poulain Concerto, the last person who had been there was Wanda Landowska. So um, <laughs> it seems a little odd that, yeah, yeah. you know, that would be, there would have been that gap. But anyway, as you know from the archives of the Library of Congress, when she came to play at the Library of Congress, she played on the harpsichord, but she also played some works on the piano. And mm -hmm. funny enough, it seems that when she played, I mean, she played a Mozart piano, uh, piano sonata, okay, but when she played Bach's Italian Concerto, she played it on the piano. She didn't play it on the harpsichord, which is really weird. Why didn't she play it on the, on the harpsichord? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, the piece, even my own teacher, Ruzhkova, said that in, into the 1960s, that she would be allowed by promoters to put a few pieces on the harpsichord, but they wanted a piano recital. Hmm. And so um, in this, you know, I say it's questionable now. I mean, part of it is, is, is rhetorical uh, exaggeration so that I get more commissions for me, obviously. I mean, let's be honest. Um, but now that that's less of an issue, uh, I would say it's questionable in the sense that uh, it has to justify itself. And I think there, quite often it has to implicitly justify itself. For instance, um, there was an article in the New York Times uh, last week about the, the late harpsichordist Scott Ross. Um, who, who, who died in the 1980s, I think. And, you know, they called him a bad boy harpsichordist. I mean, the playing is pretty orthodox. You know, he didn't do anything with new music. He wasn't really interested in it. Um, he played basically Bach and Couperin, you know, but because he wore a leather jacket, oh my God, he was this kind of bad boy harpsichordist, right? And, and it's, that, there is an implicit uh, um, sort of negative stance toward the instrument there, as though... Um, he had to wear a leather jacket to find some audience for the for the instrument. And I would say, well, you know, actually, we want to listen to the instrument by itself. You know, for every commission I have, and 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 you know, my career has no, uh, uh, fortunately, ha you know, there's no gaps in it. I mean, it's it's I'm very happy with it. But um, occasionally, you'll have a a promoter or more often a an orchestra programmer for concerto saying. I don't know, you know, it's an early music instrument. I'm not so sure. And, you know, in that sense, um, it has to, it's on the defensive in the way that a piano might not be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Anne, uh, even uh, when you look at the career of Goosens or, you know, um, uh, Jean Craxton, for example, Jane Craxton in the, in the UK on the oboe, even 50 years ago, people didn't take the oboe seriously as a concerto instrument. You know, they didn't take the trumpet mm -hmm. seriously as a concerto instrument. So, yeah, you know, other than the true. piano and the violin, most instruments have to, I mean, now we look, you know, this is a programmer. We have a generation of amazing cellists. But 50, 60 years ago, how many were there? Not that many. Mm -hmm. um, so Not a soloist anyway. Yeah, that's, that's right. Not a soloist. And uh, so I think, you know, the, the way that we can do that, and this is why I, I purposefully don't interfere with composers. Um, for example, George, George Lewis wrote me a, a piece three years ago, which was premiered at, um, at the Miller Theater in New York. George Lewis writes really hard music. Yes. In a sense, I almost say, hey, it's really not my business. You do what you do, and I do what I do, and try to do the best that I can, because the instrument needs... You know, I can't curate the voice for the instrument. The composers can do that so that with the benefit afforded by hindsight, we can look back and say that there were all styles applied to the instrument. Um, so I think we have that as, as commissioners, as programmers, as players, we have that responsibility to not, uh, to not say that the instrument can do this, but it can't do that. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable to see what you've, achieved in this regard. And you, you've said that you wanted to uh, work so that no one else would be able to say that it's remarkable for a harpsichordist to play modern music on, on the instrument. And you have done that. You are doing that every moment. I, I hope so. We, you know, it's been, it's been a good 10, 11 years. So let's see what we can do in 30 years. Yeah. 
You know, to to finish with the ending of this beautiful program, um, I was thinking about how you put together the Fisher uh, piece at the very end, the Pasakalia, and how it comes out of and relates to the overture to Orpheus, the Andresen, which is such a dark and incantatory piece. It, this word chronic popped into my mind. It's a word I'd never think of. It just popped into my mind when I heard the opening of that piece. As you say, he evokes Orpheus. And uh, I believe that this last piece, the, the Fisher piece, does have a connection, a delicate connection to the Orpheus myth as well. Yes, right? well, it comes from a set of uh, suites which are related to the nine muses. And this is from, um, I think, the last of the suites, which is um, Urani, uh, Urania yeah. or Urania. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, there's a classical connection, you might say. Um, I went to a, uh, a lecture uh, when, I was in, when I was in college by Andrew Lawrence King, uh, the, the harpist, you know, and the, and, mm -hmm. the, and the early music harpist. And he talked about um, Monteverdi's Orfeo and this, this notion of the kind of uh, you know, perfect, fantastical instrument. And in, and in the case of the Orpheus legend, there's this uh, notion that Orpheus had this, this lyre that could evoke everything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Ovid talks, I guess, a little bit about this too, um, where when Monteverdi, you know, in act two of Orfeo, um, Orfeo goes under to the underworld and there's his famous... Uh, air where he calls upon the gods and the, and the king of the underworld to let his wife, um, you know, back to let his wife out. And we have, you know, the, the cornetti and we have the violins and there's this notion of, you know, sound hits the wall and then it comes back as this echo, right? But also what, what Monteverdi is doing with his, um, with his continuo grouping, which is, which is, which is all specified and very varied, very, very, there's a term, uh, is that, uh, in a sense, he's saying that this one instrument, this one, this one imaginary uh, instrument, you know, Lydia Gare talks about the imagine, you know, gallery of imaginary works, right? This mm -hmm. one imaginary instrument can do and say and express everything. And I think in Fisher's Pasacalia, you hear, you hear the evocation of almost everything. You hear an orchestra, you hear um, a lute, you hear a harp. You hear a harpsichord, for better or worse. You hear the flute. You hear the voice. And um, uh, I remember Andrew Lawrence King saying that Chacon's and Pasacalia's are kind of um, beauty pageants. You know, every <laughs> every couplet is a is a sort of uh, yeah. is a is a is a chance for a different aspect of the ensemble or the instrument to shine. It's a beautiful piece. And J.K.F. Fisher is not so well known, but he was hugely influential. And tell us just one bit about how you place him in the, you know, the history and so on. What's his significance today? Well, actually, um, J.K.F. Fisher's uh, music was introduced by Landowska. Oh. Um, we know that she performed his music at the at her last public recital, which was at the at the Frick collection in the 19, 1952, 1953. There's a live recording of it where she she actually has a memory lapse and she makes up about half of it. And it's mm. fa fantastic. And William F. Buckley um, said in an interview that he was at that recital. Um, because as you know, Buckley was a great lover yes. of, of the harpsichord and of harpsichord music. Yes. And he was himself a harpsichordist. And he said that she you know, she was, she was quite old and her eyesight was, you know, not what it had been and that she entered this fantastical world with that piece. And certainly we, we know that Bach was influenced by Fisher because Bach even quotes themes by Fisher in the Well-Tempered Clavier. Um, I think particularly book two of Well-Tempered Clavier. And, you know, and I mean, you, I think this kind of music, it helps position uh, a figure like Bach, I, I, you know, Great man theory of history is something that's been um, discarded, or you know, we say that it's been it's questioned, and I think with 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 good reason to a, to a, some extent. Um, but part of looking at what influenced Bach is to remind ourselves that Bach always saw himself in relation to his predecessors. Bach mm -hmm. was constantly trying to do as well 
and to measure up to them. You know, Bach mm -hmm. looked up to, it's hard for us to think about this, but Bach considered his predecessors to be better composers than he was. And he mm -hmm. was, he was trying to do his, his best for their, you know, you might say their tacit approval or for, or to, uh, you know, that the musical work to some extent represents, uh, you know, an announcement of the artistic self on the hand, on the, on the part of Bach. And so, um, anything that we can quote and that can, to, can give us a view into his musical world will, you know, as Landowska said, uh, will give us hints on how to play his music when he, when he is not offering those hints. You know, it's been wonderful to trace these threads, Bach, Landowska, and the history of composers writing for the harpsichord throughout this conversation. And I'm so pleased it worked out that you were Thank able you to, do. to do this. You know, uh, I know people will enjoy this concert very, very much. And for us, we wanted to thank you for your friendship with the library. Thank you, you really and are a friend. Thank you. You really are a friend too. And look, I mean, we'll get through this. And uh, the first place I want to visit, because my parents live there, is DC. And you know, I'll come around and you know, bang pots and pans and uh, <laughs> you know, annoy you yeah. guys. So we'll we'll continue our path. Okay. <laughs> we will. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. See you.